good to see you as we gather together to worship the Lord. If you're visiting with us, trust you feel at home among us. And for those following on in recordings of services too, trust as we meet around God's word that we long to meet with him, to hear from him. The little tracks are there, uh, Roger Carswell's. You hopefully received them in the way, and if not, take them on the way out and take more of them. There are plenty of them there for everybody to pass on. Roger Carswell just writing in regards to the late Queen Elizabeth II and to the Lord Jesus Christ. So those are there. Please do take them, make use of them. If we need more of them, if you want to give them out to people, let us know and we'll get you more. The prayer meeting Sunday mornings at 11.15 and Sunday school and Bible classes in the morning, one at 10.45 afternoon one at three in Kinnego and, and make people in the area aware that, that those are open to everyone. Um, children's Church in the minor hall after the offering in the service this morning. Mission envelopes for September and October supporting Stephen and Linda Park uh, who serve with UFM Mission in Uganda and we'll mention a bit about them in, in the prayers of intercession. Many of you are very familiar with them. Um, Choir practice for the harvest service, qu services, choir practice today at 4.15 again. Uh, that's for the harvest services next Sunday, uh, 12 noon and 7 p.m. And tonight, uh, over in Tatarahan at 6.30, a, a family service there, uh, parkers, faith mission workers in the border area along, along with others. And then at 7.30 tonight, Derry Crew, Mission Hall, Norman and Lorna Wilkinson, who represent Logos Ministries International speaking in regard to that mission work. So that's 7.30 in Dairy Crew this evening. And just to say, last Wednesday night, the midweek uh, meeting over in Tatarhan with Shane speaking in regard to Portugal. If you weren't able to get along to that, uh, his talk is uh, uploaded onto the, the church YouTube channel. So if you check the website or the Facebook page, you'll find the link to that or find it on YouTube. So it's Shane's talk is there for those who weren't able to get along. And please do listen to that and get behind that young man and the work that he's seeking to do for the Lord. And if you weren't able to give to that work and you want to do so, speak to, to Alan Beacom. I haven't warned Alan of that, but speak to Alan Beacom this morning. I'm sure we can send uh, a gift off uh, from the church uh, in that regard. Monday evening, tomorrow night, the campaigners at the normal times and, and Tuesday evening, likewise, campaigners. And then Wednesday, the prayer and Bible study in Kinnego Hall at 8. Thursday, the football continuing, and Thursday at 7, Kirk Session meeting, elders meeting, uh, and then 8 p.m., the, the committee meeting in the side room here. Friday, Christian Endeavour at 7, and Youth Club at 8.15 in the church hall. And then the notice as well, is, and in more detail of it, of the CE rally in Clonanese. More detail of that's on your printed announcement sheet uh, or on the, 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 the website announcements. Harvest Thanksgiving service will be mentioned our next Sunday at 12 noon. I'll be here, God willing, at 12 noon. Then 7 p.m., the Reverend Nigel Reed is preaching at the evening service. Our choir are taking part uh, in both services. Um, Nigel's the minister. Nigel Reed's the minister in, in Tully Allen and Mount Norris congregations near Market Hill. So Nigel all been well belong next Sunday evening preaching. And de decorating of the meeting house and the vestibule as per normal is on Friday evening at, at 7. So if you're able to help out with that, come along Friday at 7. If you want to bring materials to help with the decorating, that will be appreciated as well. So that's Friday at 7. Um, and the organisations, the youth organisations, or other organisations of the church to decorate windows as per usual. So if you've forgotten what per usual was, uh, ask and we'll, we'll fill you in on that. So we hope uh, the organisations will be able to do as they did in previous years. The list for Harvest Supper is on the vestibule table, so if you're able to help with that, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. That list for the supper next Sunday evening uh, is on the table this morning there to, to, to organise. The Harvest Offering uh, will be going, in, and in our book of envelopes, there's a, a I think, a, a yellow coloured envelope at the back of the book for Harvest. Uh, the Harvest Offering is to the Presbyterian Church in Ireland United Appeal Fund, which supports the wider mission of our church overseas and home. Uh, and any excess, and we have a target of honour to meet uh, for that United Appeal Fund. I th should have checked with Treasurer, but in the region of four to five thousand pounds is our target of honour, which we seek to meet. And any additional to that from the Harvest Offering will go to the Congregation's Property Development Fund. We gather to worship God, and in Psalm 100, 
Verses 1 to 3, we find these precious words. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. And know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And when we know God as our great shepherd, the one who cares for our souls, the one who has redeemed us and loves us and watches over us, we want to praise him. We want to sing praise to our great God and Savior. Our opening hymn is Jesus is King, and I will extol him. We'll stand to sing. Let us worship God. Come to God with our prayers. Let's bow together. Let us pray. Lord God, as we seek to bring to your prayers of adoration, of thanksgiving, of supplication, Lord, we look to you and we thank you for these precious truths from your word we've been singing, that we have a priest who is there interceding for us. We have our Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest, and we need none other. And we thank you that in and through him you make all your people into a priesthood of believers. And so we thank you that we can offer up sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise to you this day in and through Jesus. We thank you for the liberty and the freedom that we have to worship and adore you. We thank you for the work of God the Holy Spirit in our lives, applying this great salvation, bringing it home to our hearts. We thank you for the blood of the eternal covenant, the blood of Jesus. And Lord, we pray, draw near to us in your mercy. Make your face to shine upon us. Help us, we pray. Help us to worship and adore you, to pour out our hearts to you. Dear Father, we thank you for the fellowship of your people. And as we have been reminded even in song, we have this fellowship not only with those in the scene of time, but a a mystical fellowship with those who are in heaven, those in glory. And so as we worship on earth, We're mindful, Lord, of people right around the globe who worship you and are part of your church, brothers and sisters in Christ on their nations around the world. And we're mindful of others, souls of the redeemed who have gone to be with you in heaven, praising you and worshiping you, and angels above who do your will, praising your name. And so, Lord, may our song of praise come out of our hearts this day with thankfulness. We thank you for King Jesus who rules and reigns in love and in power over his church and his world. 
And we thank you, dear Father, for such a precious King and Saviour and Lord, your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for that great covenant of redemption, that great plan of salvation. Even from before the creation of the world, your great plan to send your only begotten into this world to save us. Help us to take in the depths of your love for us this day afresh. Turn our eyes unto your redeeming love. Forgive us our sins, Lord, for our sins are many. Oh, not only the wicked things we willfully do as we sin against you and your word and your spirit. Father, forgive us for our hardness of heart. But forgive us, Lord, our indifference. Forgive us when we think our sins don't really matter. And maybe they think they don't, those sins don't affect anyone. And yet those sins that others know nothing about affect us and even affect others around about us that maybe know nothing of them. And those sins affect our relationship with you. And Lord, help us to see that sin ruins our lives and has ruined this world. But thank you that there is forgiveness for sins this day fullness of forgiveness in Jesus. So speak your peace into troubled hearts this day as we repent of our sins and trust in your redeeming love. Draw near to us, Lord. Pour out your Spirit upon us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 to 25, we come to the end of this precious letter to the Hebrews over Many months and different installments we have been working our way Sunday by Sunday through this letter to the Hebrews and there is much truth packed into its pages. You do well to take the whole letter actually and to read it as, as an entirety. Just read the letter through in one go. See how long that takes and you're getting an indication of the length of a sermon in the early church because this is written as a sermon to be read to, to a church. But read through it as, as a whole and be refreshed and challenged and encouraged by this precious letter of God's word. Hebrews 13, verse 20, let us hear God's word. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with you, be with all of you. Amen, and we thank God for this, his precious word. Girls and boys, in that letter, in God's word, there's a little word there, equip. We're praying that God would equip his people for what they're meant to do, to equip. Now, when you go to school or play group or whatever it may be you're going out to, your parents equip you and your teachers or leaders equip you. That means they give you what you need. So parents equip you in the morning sending you out maybe with books or with homeworks complete or with lunch or whatever it is. And when you get there, leaders and teachers equip you. That is, they give you what you need to learn and to be safe and to study and to be helped and to play safely. So we're equipped, we're given what we need. And God's word tells us that if you follow Jesus, he will equip you. He will give you what you need to follow him. When you think you can't follow him, when you're struggling to follow after him, when others around about you don't want you to follow him, Jesus will give you what you need to follow him. He will equip you. He will give you what you need. Even though you might feel very weak, when you trust in him, he will give you what you need as you trust him to follow you. I want to remind you of a story, a true story of one young lad born over 200 years ago now, I think it is, born in England, Hudson Taylor. And Hudson Taylor, some of you may have read about or heard about before. And young Hudson grew up in a Christian home. His parents were Christians. They loved the Lord Jesus. They wanted others to come to know him. They wanted their children to come to know Jesus. 
And Hudson and his sister Amelia grew, grew up in that home and they heard much about Jesus. And in the early days of his life, he would have talked much about Jesus and prayed with his family. He often heard about mission work. And girls and boys, listen in about mission work. When you hear the grown-ups talking about missionaries going off somewhere, listen in. Maybe you could listen in to that recording of Shane that was last Wednesday night and listen in to what he's seeking to do as he goes back to Portugal and get behind him and pray for him. But he would have heard about mission work, and in particular, he heard his father often talk about and pray about China. Because back then, 200 years ago, the door of China was open for missionaries to come, and that was unusual. And Hudson's father longed that more missionaries would go to China. And you know what he prayed for even before little Hudson was born? This couple prayed that before this little boy was born, if God would give them a son, they would pray and yearn that this son would become a missionary to go to China. And so at the age of five, little Hudson said one day as his father spoke about China again and heard more about it, Hudson said, Daddy, when I'm older, I will go to China as a missionary. And his mom and dad just smiled at him. Oh, they knew the prayer from before he was born, but they looked at him and they just smiled because they thought Hudson will never be able to go to China. For this wee lad was very frail and sick. He couldn't go to school. He was so frail and ill. Indeed, it wasn't until he was 11 that he was able to go to school. And some of you were thinking, I would love to have stayed at home until I was 11 and not had to go to school. But he couldn't go to school because he wasn't well. But he still was studying. His parents taught him at home and he loved to read and loved to study. But he was often sick and frail. When he left school then, a few years later, as was the case, he worked with his father. He sold medicines for people that weren't well, and he worked there. And by the age of 17, he was drifting away in his mind and heart from God and the things of Jesus. He hadn't any interest in praying, and he hadn't any interest really in thinking about the Lord or his mission to the world. He didn't know Jesus as his Savior. At the age of 17, one day, when his parents and everyone was away from home when he was off work and he got bored as many a teenager does he got bored and he wondered what he might read and he looked through the things in the house that he would read and he often had looked through and he looked through some of his father's books and he came across a leaflet a pamphlet maybe a bit like the one that you received if you didn't receive one take one when you're going home and you read it or get your parents to read it to you and he took the pamphlet out to the barn outside went in there for a quiet place to read and he lay down to read and he read about the finished work of Christ and he wondered what did that mean and he read about Jesus speaking on the cross saying it is finished and then he realized what it meant all that needed to be done for Hudson's salvation had been done when Jesus lived and died on that cross and rose from the dead all was done it was finished it was finished. And Hudson didn't need to do anything but simply trust in Jesus and believe in him. And the light of God's Spirit was shining into his life. Oh, he knew all about this message of Jesus from childhood, but now it was coming home to his soul. He realized he needed Jesus and he believed in him right away. He trusted in Jesus, called upon him. And he knew that his sins were forgiven because of what Jesus had done on the cross. And a burden to serve the Lord came into this young man's life as it does to every true Christian. He wanted to tell his mother she had been away for a time and when she came back, he wanted to be the first to tell her the good news. So when he got to the door and his mother's return, he, he ran out to tell her, but she says, Hudson, I already know. Before he spoke a word, I already know. And he was angry, he thought, that his sister Amelia tell because he had spoken to Amelia. She saw the joy in his face. And he thought Amelia had spoken to his, mo to his mother, but to their mother, but she hadn't. And this is what his mother said. Imagine this. Hudson, at that time when you were reading, I was praying. She was far, far from home, but a burden had come on her soul to pray for her son and his salvation. And I was praying and praying and praying that you would be saved. And then the burden lifted. And I knew God had answered prayer. And she came home expecting to find a son saved by the grace of God. Amazing, amazing God's hand. Christian parents, keep on praying for your loved ones. 
pray a, a burden comes on your heart even deeper than it has ever been to pray for their salvation. Well, this young man now wanted to serve the Lord and China came back into his mind. He heard as he served at home in his church and in the area where he lived and reached out to witness to people along with Amelia. He heard of a minister nearby who had a book about China and books about China weren't common back then and you couldn't search on the internet for all the things about China. And so he asked this minister to borrow the book and he read about China. And he read and he realized the people there were many of them were poor and needed medical help. And so he thought to prepare to go to China, not only will I learn more about the Bible, but I learn how to help people with medicines. And so he asked to train alongside a doctor, a Christian doctor, and he prepared to go to China. And you know, as he trained and he worked and he cared for people and he often gave people that were sick and frail, he gave them the last penny that he had and saw God provide what he had given and more back again. But one day he treated someone with a bad fever. He treated someone with a bad fever and Hudson went home and realized he now had caught the fever. And he went to see a doctor about this fever and what to do. And here's what the doctor told him. Go home and prepare to die. Go home and prepare to die. Now Hudson was already prepared to die. He knew where he was going when he would die. He knew Jesus. But he said to the doctor, and he believed in his heart, I don't believe I'm going to die just yet because I believe God wants me in China and I have work to do. And sure enough, God brought him to China. God raised him up again from frailty and strengthened him again. This lad so frail from childhood and now at the point of death with a fever and yet God sparing his life and strengthening him. Eventually he did go to China. And initially when he was there, he dressed in the clothes of back home in the day and he didn't look as if he fitted in. And one day, someone who worked alongside him, a native who was helping him, said to him, why is it that you dress the way you do? You try to speak our language and you're speaking it more and more fluently. You even try to use the chopsticks to eat like we do. But why do you dress in the clothes you do? All the other missionaries dressed as they dressed when they left Britain. They dressed in the same way when they arrived in China. And Hudson thought, if I'm to fit in with these people and to get alongside them, I'll turn my hair the way the Chinese men do and I'll wear the clothes they wear and I'll become more like them. And so he led away in missions that others had never really engaged in at that time. And God used Hudson Taylor mightily in the spread of the gospel in China. And yet today the gospel still spreads mightily in China. Hundreds if not more, thousands probably in reality down through the generations as a result of this man's life and witness were raised up to serve on the mission field. You see, God equipped the man that he had called for that work in China. God equipped him. He gave him what he needed. It wasn't that Hudson Taylor was strong in himself. He was anything but but God equipped him. And girls and boys, if you follow after Jesus, God will equip you at school or at home or wherever you are. He will give you what you need to follow after Jesus and to live for him and to praise him. You look to Jesus for help. Don't trust in yourself. Look to Jesus. We're going to sing, What Can Little Hands Do? We'll stand to sing.
worship God with our offerings and then the children's church across in the, the minor hall over the way. Thanks to Dorothy. We come to God with prayers of intercession. The slide is a, a few photos of some of those we remember today in our prayers that we're supporting the parks and their work in U Uganda. Stephen and Linda Park, known to many with the, the connections in the area here, going back a generation. And uh, you'll have heard Stephen and Linda speaking at Derry Crew over the years. They've been serving in Ch Chiwoko Hospital in Uganda for several years. Linda's uh, a doctor serving there, and Stephen trained at Irish Baptist College and teaches and preaches it, uh, as opportunities arise and with all our volunteers seeks to reach out and bring the gospel to those that come to that that hospital. It's a, it's a Christian hospital. And so they reach out with the gospel and they care for people medically uh, as Linda treats and trains up others. And the homeschooling of their three boys as well is a, a burden for prayer as well. Brian Hazel Parker served with Faith Mission in the Border District, based in Coot Hill and Cavan, and we remember them. They've been involved in summer camps in recent months, and remember them and the work that they're doing there. And then Mark and Judith Loney serving in southern Portugal with Acre International, and are well known to us as well. We come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you still put a burden on the hearts of your people to serve you whether it be at home and in our workplaces or our colleges or schools or among our family and neighbours and friends or whether it be going into other locations, even far from home. And Father, we pray you will continue to raise up your servants for the mission field, raise up those with gifts in evangelism and teaching and raise up preachers of your word, raise up for our own denomination and for others throughout the land here where your word has opened up faithfully, raise up preachers of your word, we pray. Put that desire on hearts and lives to serve you and to be prepared and to look to you to equip them for it is you who equips your people and lord how we need you to equip us this day afresh to strengthen us for service and to enable us to bring glory to your name and father we do pray for the park family in uganda that you will continue to watch over them as they settle back in after a time at home and deputation help them settle back Grant them strength, physical and spiritual. Keep them safe and protect them. And Father, we pray that you'll bless the witness of the gospel even through the caring of bodies and minds. We pray, Lord, for spiritual light to shine in. Help them to bring your word, your gospel, to many around about them. And continue to raise up more volunteers for that, that great work. Thank you for the many that do volunteer alongside Stephen there in the outreach of that, that hospital. And we pray that many more will rise up to serve you. And we pray for the boys in their schooling, Lord, that they will continue to be encouraged and content. And we pray for your Holy Spirit's work in their young lives to settle them in your love and to ground them in your truth and bless their witness to others around about them. We think of the Parker family 
to you in, in the border district with Faith Mission, and we pray that you will encourage them in their labours. We pray that you'll continue to open up new doors of opportunity for them, even as restrictions from COVID ease and more and more normality comes back into daily living. We pray, Lord, for more and more opportunities for them to reach out into the local community, and may they see people gathered into the different events and meetings that they hold, and may they see souls saved to the praise of your wonderful grace. Father, we think too of Mark and Judith and the work going on in southern Portugal. Encourage them today. Help them with the burdens they carry for loved ones. Help them with the burdens of responsibility they carry for the, carry for the fellowship there. And we pray, Lord, refresh their hearts in Christ, even this very moment. We pray for their girls too, as they settle into life here in Northern Ireland, that you will continue to provide for them and help them and lead and guide them and make your gracious face to shine upon them this day. And Father, for others who are serving you and in need of your mighty hand upon them, we name loved ones to you this day, asking for your help and encouragement. For those who have returned back from service and are seeking your guidance and your will for days to come, we ask, Lord, your hand upon them to make clear your way and your purpose and open up fresh opportunities and avenues for them. And Father, as we think of the life of our fellowship here and the various outreaches that take place week by week, we pray continue to raise up those servants with a, a concern for the glory of your name and help us, we pray, to point people to Jesus. Help us, O oh Lord. And we pray that gracious work of your Holy Spirit to bring this gospel home to hearts and lives, that young people and grown-ups alike will hear the good news of Jesus and believe it and call upon his name. They will put their trust in him and know the joy and assurance of sins forgiven and a welcome into your family. Lord, move among us, we pray. Help us in preparation for harvest services. Lord, may your gracious hand be upon us. And may people be gathered in from the wider community and around your word. And may they receive a welcome and may they hear your great gospel. Father, we pray for your help in our daily living. That we would want to live to praise you. That we would want to do your will. And we pray, Father, in this harvest season for those busy in, in the work of harvesting. Father, we pray for your help and your protection and your safekeeping. And we pray, Lord, for your provision in all things. And as you provide seed time and harvest, we pray that you too will provide the market that is needed. We pray, Lord, for your help and your mercies to abound. For, Lord, we depend upon you for the very breath of life. Be near to loved ones who are unwell today and unable to be with us. May they be encouraged in their hearts to lay their burdens at the feet of Jesus. And may their love for Jesus be inflamed within their hearts this very day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Turning to Hebrews 13, verse 20 to 25, the concluding verses here of this letter. Equipped to do God's will. As we were speaking to the girls and boys about God equipping, so that is the focus of the sermon. Equipped, God giving what is needed. It's not that we are able to equip ourselves but we need God to equip us. And so as the, this letter, this great letter comes to a close, it comes to a close with a benediction that turns into a, a doxology. Now we tend to close our services with a benediction. That word is a Latin background, means a good word, Benny, meaning a good, good word. So a benediction is a good word. It's really a sermon in a nutshell. It's the gospel in a nutshell. And usually the benedictions are Trinitarian in their makeup. And this benediction, I believe, is Trinitarian, although the Holy Spirit is not spoken of explicitly, but we come to that. And this benediction, this good word, is spoken at the end of the letter, and then a few remarks come afterward that maybe seem strange in the, in the way they appear, but we come to that in due course. And this, the writer, who does not name himself in the actual letter, although some translations may insert the name of Paul, or may speculate, some people may speculate as to other human authors. We're not told explicitly in the actual letter who wrote this, but it's clearly coming with the power of the Spirit of God. It's clearly apostolic in its origin and its content. 
And as with the Gospels, if it wasn't apostles that were writing, it was someone shoulder to shoulder with an apostle who was writing. It comes with apostolic power. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you. And it is God who does the equipping, in other words, first of, equipped to do God's will by the God of peace and resurrection power. It's the God of peace who equips. The God of peace. The Greek word irene, the Hebrew background is shalom. And that reality of peace, of being at peace with God, the God who brings rebels like us who were alienated from him and at war with him, and he brings us into peace with himself, into fellowship with himself, and he equips us. Because of this great peace that we have with him and with others, he gives peace. He brings peace wholeness. The peace of the Bible, the peace of the gospel, the peace of God is not just the absence of conflict. And we pray for such peace around the world. We pray for it in regard to Ukraine or Myanmar or Yemen or Syria. We we pray for the absence of conflict, but biblical peace goes further than that. It's about the wholeness of life, the fullness of life. It's about the shalom of God, the rest of God. And may the God of peace the God who brings peace into troubled hearts. And these readers in the early church from a Hebrew background were troubled. They were being pulled backwards into Judaism and they needed to be reminded of the God of peace, the God who gives peace to troubled souls, the God who brings us into fellowship with himself, intimacy with himself. And they're being reminded even in the closing words of this letter of the great God, the living and true God, the God of peace, the God of shalom the God who is at work in their lives. Even though they might be fixated on their frailties and their troubles and their trials and their heartaches and even their persecutions, they are being reminded of the God of peace. And this prayer, this benediction prayer, now may the God of peace, the God of peace, may he be at work in your life. How we need the God of peace, the living God at work in our lives to Bring his peace to bear in our hearts afresh this day. Is your heart full of trouble and anxiety and wondering what might happen and what might not happen and what the future holds or wondering about the the past, recent or even further back and as to what you've done and maybe it comes to the light and is brought out into the open and anxieties rise up for all sorts of reasons. Maybe your anxiety rises up because of a, a concern for loved ones. Now may the God of peace May he do his work in your life this day. Pray that for others. Pray it even now for others around about you, that the God of peace would be at work in our lives. The God of peace. He's not only the God of peace, but he's also the God who brought again from from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. So, So he's the God of resurrection power, the God of peace and power. So he has the power to raise Jesus from the dead, victorious over Satan and hell and sin and death. And if he has that power, he has power to help you, is the implication. He is the God with resurrection power to help you today in whatever might be your trouble and your trial. And so the prayer at the close of this letter, this benediction, this gospel in a nutshell, is that God would be at work in lives. That's what we're saying as we pronounce benedictions. We're pronouncing them upon our congregation at the close of the service. We're really speaking the gospel in a nutshell to people's hearts, yearning for his good work in our lives, yearning for it. And so we are equipped to do God's will by the God of peace and resurrection power and how we need him, how we need him. And secondly, this equipping comes about by God through the work of God's Son, It's by the blood of the eternal covenant. Our Lord Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep who was raised from the dead. And it speaks here of the blood of the eternal covenant. When we think of that statement, ponder it for a while. So this equipping and every blessing comes by God through Christ and his finished work. That language that Hudson Taylor we spoke of earlier being gripped by the finished work of Christ, the blood of the covenant that has been shed once for all, the blood of Jesus. It's an eternal covenant. Notice that. As we look back into eternity past, so to speak, 
this covenant written before creation came about, before people were created, this eternal covenant, the Father, the Son entered into an agreement and the Father would send the Son and the Son willing and glad to come and take human nature and to live and to die to redeem a people for himself to the praise of the grace of God. This eternal covenant, what's rooted in eternity past and it stretches on for eternity future, forever and ever, this eternal covenant will never diminish in its power and its glory. And so Christian, as you think of the blood of the eternal covenant, Jesus' blood will always avail for you. Jesus will always be your great high priest who intercedes for you, your mediator. Jesus will always be your all in all. The blood of the eternal covenant. There will not be a point in eternity future when you're not rejoicing in Jesus and the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and the shalom, the peace of God within your life. And so the equipping that comes about by God's great power comes through the finished work of Jesus Christ. We'll never be equipped to serve unless we're trusting in that finished work, unless we're resting in the finished work of Christ, believing in him. We'll never be equipped for service otherwise. It's coming, flowing from God the Father through God the Son, and then thirdly, it comes in the power of the Holy Spirit. And while the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, is not mentioned explicitly in these couple of verses, it is implicit. You see, the blood of the eternal covenant comes home to hearts, verse 21, as we're equipped with everything good that we may do God's will. And who is it that brings this home to hearts that we're equipped? It is God the Holy Spirit who brings it home. It is God the Holy Spirit who equips and empowers and so this benediction is Trinitarian like many others through Scripture. It's God at work. It's God at work in lives. God working in us. As the eyes of hearts and minds are turned to Jesus and what he has done for us and what he continues to do for us as he intercedes for us, and he will come in glory for us. And so hearts are strengthened in the gospel. Hearts are strengthened in Christ. Hearts are equipped Hearts are equipped. Now, sometimes you might hear sermons about giving maybe a sweet title, and the danger of giving titles to anything at times can take you in the wrong direction, but giving a sweet title like here are five or here are ten points that will make you a super strong Christian with a victorious Christian life. And you come along and you hear the message, and it's just like these quick fix things that if you put into place, then all will be well. and and when you really think about the message, when you really think about it, it's self-help theology. It's telling you what you can do to fix it all. And I hope you never hear that sort of thing. And I hope you don't be gripped by that sort of thing. But it's everywhere. Something gripping like that, that people think, that's what I need to hear. A five-point message that tells me what I must do for a victorious Christian life. To be equipped well, the gospel tells us that it is God that we need. Not some sleek sort of system. It is God that we need. We need to be equipped by God through the finished work of God's Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in the power of God, the Holy Spirit. We need God. That means getting alongside the Lord day by day. That means getting to know him more and more. That means delighting in him. That's not some quick fix. That's, that's the joy of the believer's heart to walk with the Lord and to be strong in the Lord. But there's a battle there for the evil one would keep, him from, from, keep us from such closeness with God. And the evil one would tell us, oh, you just need to sort it yourself and get things into gear and you can sort it all. You can fix it. But when we try to fix things ourselves and we try to be equipped for service ourselves and we try to do it in our own strength, we will find, if we haven't already, that we come away feeling. We come away in our weakness, and we come away with maybe resentful hearts, and we come away wondering and questioning why all this quick fix stuff didn't work. And hopefully we're brought back to a place where we realize it is God I need. It is God I need to equip me. I need God, and I need to come to know him in and through Jesus. And 
as we ponder God's purpose for us as Christians, as we trust in him. Often we say from scripture, and it is scriptural, or often I might say it and even preach it, or pray it, pray that God will be at work in our lives for our good and for his glory. And that's biblical. Now think about that for a minute. God at work in our lives for our good and for his glory. But such is the state of our sinful old nature and self-centeredness that we quickly turn a biblical teaching about our good into wanting our ease and our comfort and our leisure. Now, we may not be full blown down a prosperity gospel message, which is no gospel at all, that prosperity teaching from America or wherever it might come out of nowadays that tells you that if you trust Jesus, you will be healthy and wealthy and never have a problem in life. That's, that's not the gospel. But we, we, we may not embrace that. There's something within us that longs for ease and pleasure and comfort. Something that's in us that just longs for that. We long for all to be going calmly and easily. And while we may not want the millions, we certainly want the thousands. And there's a, a desire in our heart for it. That's why the prosperity message or teaching grips so many people because there is within a sinful heart a desire for it but when we're praying for God to be at work for our good Christian for our good think of the line that's there this morning as God works in us for our good obedience for it's very well expounded here in Hebrews 13 that God would equip you with everything good that you may do his will that you may do his will. So when God's at work for our good, it is so that we may do his will, that we might be obedient, not so that we will live at ease and never have a struggle or a battle or a heartache or a pain, but rather that we would seek to do his will. He gives us what we need to do his will, his good and perfect and pleasing will. That we would do what is pleasing in his sight, in other words. That's what God is seeking to do as he works in our lives, if only we will desire that rather than kick against it. That's God's desire for us, his purpose for us as Christians, that we would live lives that please him, pleasing in his sight, as it says there in verse 21. And so pray for one another and pray for ourselves as we follow after Jesus, if we're so doing that Almighty God would be at work in us as the eyes of our heart look unto Jesus and we would seek to do God's will, not our own, but seek to do God's will, to be obedient to his will. And how do we know his will? Through his word. He has made it very clear. And then we see fourthly that as we're equipped to do God's work, it is by the power of Almighty God through the finished work of Christ and the Spirit of God applies it so that we become more and more obedient to the will of God. But it is, fourthly, for the glory of Jesus. So the benediction we said earlier turns into a doxology. The word doxology means giving glory to you. It's it's an expression of praise, often a hymn or a song of praise. And so the benediction ends with, through Jesus Christ, that we would be pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The doxology. Glory to Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Glory to God. And as we want to live obedient lives, it is so that Jesus will be glorified. Not that our names will be glorified, but that Jesus will be glorified. We find ourselves often wanting our name to be made much of, even subtly. Even subtly. There's not a heart here today that doesn't have this, whether it's explicit or subtle wanting our name to be lifted up. When we present our image to the world and we present our picture to the world, oh, it's a a grand picture we present of a successful study and workplace and home life and family and the pictures are neat and tidy and all looks great, but we all know that the reality is very different and our lives are a mess, all of them. They're messy. And it's the glory of the name of Jesus we want to lift high. We're not meant to be pretending that we've got it all sorted and we're all perfect and we haven't a problem in the world. We want people to know that we have a savior. We are people with problems and with heartaches and we're broken and we have 
all sorts of sins battling against us and we need the strength of Almighty God to resist and to yield not to temptation. And we stand only in God's strength, not our own, for the glory of Jesus. We want people to know it's Jesus. Jesus who keeps a hold of us. It's Jesus who comforts us. It's Jesus who leads us on with himself. It's Jesus who gives us hope in the darkest of days when there seems to be no hope for the glory of Jesus. So we want to obey him, to do his will by his strength as he works in us. Oh, pray that God would be so at work in our lives that we would want to do his will to the praise of his name. And fifthly, that's the last point, for the glory of Jesus and to the praise of of his grace, to the praise of his grace. Does it strike you as a little bit odd? Now, we've all written letters and our order of writing it all can be a bit, especially when you wrote with pen and ink long ago and it wasn't something you could erase or it wasn't something you could cut and paste and restructure. But remember, this letter is written by the Spirit of God. Whoever the human author is, it is clearly inspired by the Spirit of God. It comes with that authority ringing out of it. It is apostolic authority. But it's strikingly as strange that Hebrews should end with a beautiful benediction in doxology in verses 20 and 21. And then verse 22 to 25, he starts saying this, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. And so he opens up this great appeal Listen to this word of exhortation, this sermon, this written sermon, that if it was to be read publicly, audibly, would have taken well over an hour. You read it out loud and see how long it would have taken. This is a brief sermon, he's saying. I appeal to you, bear with my word of exhortation. Listen to me now. Hear the message of the gospel. Don't fall back into the ritual of Judaism, thinking that's better than what we have now in Christ for there were those that saying that, that uh, these Christians, they've lost the good way and they've lost the good things of, of the temple in Jerusalem and the sacrificial system and all the outer things because they're following after Christ now and they're, they're not part of that. And the writer is saying time after time in the letter, you have not gone backwards by following Jesus. You have entered into the fullness of what the old promised. You've entered into the fullness. The ritual of the old covenant and the tabernacle and the temple was pointing forward to Jesus, the Lamb of God, the one whose blood is the blood of the eternal covenant. So don't fall back into ritual and regulation. And how we need to hear that every day, because it wasn't just Christians from a Hebrew background who were being pulled back into such things, to the ritual and the regulation of the the Judaic system. Every one of us, because of an old sinful nature, are in danger of going back into ritual and trusting in our regulation and in our observance of things, trusting in our works rather than in Christ. And so we need to be reminded this exhortation needs to come to us. I appeal to you, bear with my word of exhortation. Realize that Jesus is far superior to the old covenant and to the old mediator Moses, that Jesus is far superior to angelic deliverers. Jesus is far superior to all that has come before. He is the fullness of it all. And in him you find your life. And he says, you should know that our brother Timothy, now why does he mention Timothy? You know, our our brother Timothy has been released, released from prison, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. So this writer is going to come soon, and if Timothy comes as well, he'll be with him. He's expecting to see these believers. And he's talking about other leaders, and all the saints, saints are believers, other Christians. We're made saints, we're made holy by God, by trusting in, in the Son of God. And those who come from Italy send greetings, and some would would read into that or maybe read out of that, whatever the case they think. These Hebrew Christians, it seems, maybe were living in Italy, living in Rome. And wherever the writer of the letter was writing back to them, some had come from Italy. And they're sending greetings. They knew these believers. Whether that's the background isn't of that much importance to us, but it may be. Maybe that these Hebrew believers were living in Rome or living in Italy at the time of writing. But why is Timothy picked out as as an example, a reminder, along with others? Well, it's a reminder to these 
Hebrew Christians, these early Christians, in danger of falling back into Judaism and turning away from Christ and even renouncing Jesus as Messiah. Here, we're part of something even bigger than Judaism. When God saved Abraham and his family, it was so that they would be a light to the Gentiles. And now that is being fulfilled, the writer saying, we're part of, of a family now. We're brothers and sisters. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters. We're in Christ now. And this family is made up of people from different nations. Greet them. Welcome them. Think of Timothy. Who was Timothy? Well, he was a child of a mixed marriage. Jew and Gentile, his parents. And here is Timothy. And this gospel is for all. And here is Timothy, frail in and of himself, humanly speaking, would be unlikely to stand against the hardships and the persecutions and the trials and the troubles. But here's frail Timothy. Remember him. Hopefully he'll come to see you soon and preach the word to you. But remember him and his example of what God does, did and was doing in and through him. This man so frail of constitution told to drink a little wine for his stomach's sake. This man timid of nature and yet God had equipped him and strengthened him and he was following after Jesus even through prison and being released he was still following after Jesus. So take heart. Take heart if God can equip Timothy to live in obedience and to bring glory to the name of Jesus. God can equip you or me. God is the God of peace and the God of resurrection power. And this blood of the eternal covenant is mighty. And the work of God, the Holy Spirit, applying it to lives is blessed. So keep on trusting. Keep on trusting. Maybe today, Christian, you have lost heart in your following after Jesus. You feel the weight of disappointment or the weight of expectation that you struggle to live up to. You feel all sorts of burdens in your mind and your heart and your soul. You've maybe been serving in some sort of ministry for years and you see little fruit or little impact through it all. Well, keep on looking to Almighty God to equip you to follow after him, to follow after Jesus with all your heart. It is God you need. It is to draw near to God. Eyes by faith looking to the lamb that was slain, the shed blood of Jesus crying out for the work of God, the Holy Spirit, to apply the salvation day by day to our lives, to equip us with everything good that we may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And what's the final benediction at verse 25? Grace be with all of you. Grace. It's all of God's grace. It's all to the praise of the glory of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. He is the language of Ephesians 1. To the praise of the glory of the grace of God in Jesus. Grace be with you. Amen. We're going to sing in closing the old hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation, the one who is our strength, who equips us.
close with the benediction from Hebrews 13, verse 20 onwards. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.